The Bible is the inspired Word of God. It is the only book that reveals to us what is wrong with our minds. Let us study the Bible, for if we do so, we shall find rest for our souls. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this place. You actually made it without getting lost. Honestly, I don't know who found this place out and how they really expect us to find this place out. But you made it. It's an indication that you have great minds. We thank the Lord for bringing all of us together. I am uh, going to set the tone for this weekend uh, whose theme is this mind. This mind. That is going to be the theme for this weekend, and tonight, knowing you are tired and many of you got lost a couple of times, I know my wife and a friend were rescued by someone <laughs> after getting lost, uh, I'm not going to take much of your time. It is simply going to be to set forth a problem, a problem to which the theme seems to answer. The theme is this mind, and it seems to answer a problem. And the problem is, what's wrong with our mind? So I'll give an, an introduction, and then at some point, I would turn to the screen and share some burdens uh, with you as Africans. Let me begin by talking about the mind. How many of you have read the classic book by John Snyder titled, I Love Books? I see only one person, perhaps two. You've got to read that book. It's an old book. The last time I checked, it was last published in 1959. It is a classic that everyone who aspires to train the mind must read. In one of the chapters of this classic, Snyder begins with this insightful sentence. The sentence reads, quote, it is not how tall a man is or how much he weighs that counts in life, but how much he knows, what he can do, and how good a mind he has. I underscore the last phrase. It isn't your stature or your weight, but how good a mind you have. To illustrate this point, uh, John Snyder uh, recounted the story, the story from the life of Isaac Watts. How many of you have heard the name Isaac Watts? Okay, this time, almost all of you. Isaac Watts was one of the three greatest English hymn writers of all time. The other two are Charles Wesley and Fanny Crosby. You got it right. Well, judging from the sheer volume and quality of hymns that Watts wrote, very few people would have known that he was a man of very small stature. He was a very little man. Even the Queen of England, who had been desirous to meet this great man, didn't know that Watts was of a little stature. And so one day, Isaac Watts was ushered into the presence of the Queen and the queen was very surprised that this is the Isaac Watts. And so she exclaimed and she said, 
is this the great little Dr. Watts? Now, if you are Watts, what would you respond to, you know, the queen who tries to put you down, kind of? Um, from his early childhood, Watts had been able to put everyday conversation into rhymes. And so when the queen asked, is this the great little Dr. Watts? Without any hesitation or embarrassment, Watts responded with this rhyme. You have to hear the ending to know what he was saying. He, he said to the queen, were I so tall to reach the pole, or grasp the ocean with my span, I must be measured by my soul, the mind's the standard of the man. What was right? The mind is the true measure of a person. Consequently, the best preparation any one of us can make in life is to train the mind to know, to love, and to think. We must not only train the mind, we must also keep the mind keen and fit by educating it to the very highest degree. I believe that the purpose of our meeting this weekend is to train our minds for the master's service. That is why you've chosen for your theme, the mind. The mind. Before I go into what I am planning to share with you uh, tonight, uh, let me say a, 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 a few things about the organizers of this meeting and also the theme and also where I am coming from. As you all know, um, this weekend's retreat is sponsored by campus. Campus is the Center for Adventist Ministry to Public University Students. It is a division of the Michigan Conference of Seventh-day Adventist, and campus exists for one major purpose. Our mission is to train and empower young people to be brilliant, godly, and effective soul winners. You see, biblical excellence combined with spiritual excellence. Consistent with this philosophy, our campus was the birthplace of GYC. Many of you know GYC. And so it's not only the birthplace, campus is also the sponsor of GYC, which is a grassroots young people's movement that aspires for the same kinds of things campus stands for. I'm here to say that campus is also privileged that in addition to GYC, we are also sponsoring Alive, which, by the way, uh, is a spin-off from GYC. Um, I want you to know that this group of Africans, by the way, I like your name, Alive. We have to write a history. Who came up with that acronym, Alive? Africans living in view of eternity. You describe yourself as a grassroots organization of North American Africans, students, and young professionals, and their friends, so it's not just for Africans, and their friends, you know, who are seeking to prepare the world in this generation. I want you to know that I am very much impressed by the program you pulled together. I see a wide representation here, different skills represented here. I am impressed. Because you are trying to pull together an African union that our leaders on the continent are not able to do. So you have a different mindset. I'm also impressed by your mission. If you use your mind and flip a page or two back from where I was reading, um, it has a statement about who you are. It's, it's a descriptive statement, you know, describing what a life is, Africans living in view of eternity, you were established in 2006, and uh, you say a whole lot of things, and you are sponsored by campus. And then you tell us, um, last year you had the first Alive conference. The theme was one in God's family. I know Randy Skeet, our campus evangelist, was the one who spoke at that conference. And then you have your mission statement, which says, amongst other things, that you, 
young people, students, and young professionals living in view of eternity seek to revive, nurture, and challenge a generation of Africans who are determined to hasten the second coming of Jesus Christ in our generation. That is your mission. And then your aim, on the next page, you seek to mobilize, train African students and young professionals to be actively involved in ministry at the local church level and beyond. Two, you plan to hold retreats, spiritual retreats annually to awaken African youth and young adults. And this is one of your uh, programs. And then you want to actively support evangelistic efforts in Africa. And I'm sure during the week you will tell us some of the things you have in mind. And finally, your aim is to serve as a networking resource for African young people. I am impressed. You have set for yourself a very high standard, a high mission, and I pray that the Lord will help you fulfill these objectives. As long as you remain true to these sets of ideals, campus would continue to be your sponsor. If that's clear, say amen. I want to say also that I am extremely pleased to be one of the speakers for this uh, weekend session. I'm pleased for two major reasons. The first reason is the theme you have chosen, the mind. I interviewed some of your leadership, why you chose the mind. Uh, in the brochure, the president has explained why the theme was chosen in the opening page, and somewhere, if you use your mind to look through the pages, you are going to discover there is a, a section describing why you chose the theme. When I interviewed your leadership, one of the things you kept emphasizing is you want to focus on the mind so that as African young people, we will develop a certain mindset, a certain way of thinking that will change not only our lives, our continent, but even our church. I commend you for focusing on the mind. It is said, that great minds have purposes, others have wishes. See, there are many people who just have wishes, they don't have minds. The fact that you are focusing on the mind indicates you have a great mind. Oh, by the way, you may have heard this statement, uh, it's a quote from Eleanor Roosevelt, uh, the former first lady of the 32nd US president. She said, great minds discuss ideas. Average minds discuss events, and small minds discuss people. Think about it. If you have a small mind, you always discuss people, gossip and talk about the latest, you know, hairstyle, and it's, you know, small mind, people. Average mind, they discuss events. Have you heard the latest sports results? I mean, events. But great minds discuss what? ideas. The fact that you've chosen the mind, I mean, it's so abstract. You've chosen the mind, or better yet, this mind, as your theme suggests to me that you are great minds, because you want to discuss ideas. I would even dare say that you represent uh, the greatest African minds in the church today. And make no mistake, let no one attempt to belittle you for daring to discuss ideas. Small minds are always the first to condemn great ideas. So when people criticize you or try to discourage you, don't take it seriously. Nurture your mind with great thoughts for you will never go higher than you think. This is a statement from Benjamin Disraeli, a British statement and foreign minister. I am impressed and I'm pleased to be here with you because of the theme you have chosen. You have kept me working. I want to make a confession. I've been feeling sick for some time, um, and many of you have been praying for me, but part of the sickness was because of the theme you chose. Um, the past 72 hours have broken all the health laws. I have slept only about three or four hours during the past three days. 
Because as I started studying into this subject, I just couldn't sleep. And besides, you know, uh, I, I, you, you, you place a burden on my heart. And I'm impressed and I'm pleased and privileged that I can speak to you on this great theme. Second, I am privileged um, to be here with you because this is one of the few times I'll get to speak to a group that comprises predominantly African people, students and young professionals in North America. You know I speak to different audiences, but this is one of the few times I get to speak to Africans. And this affords me an opportunity to be very candid with you. I know I can speak to you as candidly as possible without having any of you stone me. You, you know that I, I, I speak quite candidly. I speak my mind in both my writings as well as my public uh, messages. I tend to address some of the burning issues in the church. And in some cases, I have vigorously challenged certain kinds of shallow thinking that is being imposed upon the church by certain thought leaders. And because I do so candidly, it isn't always well received. In fact, some consider me as a troublemaker. I'm always creating controversy. And believe it or not, in some cases, even people want to ban me from speaking because I, whatever I speak, I speak so candidly and people get nervous and angry. But this is one of the few times I can speak to you as one African to another set of African, and I can be as candid and blunt with you as possible. I know you can't bite me or shoot me. Uh, Nelson Mandela, one of the greatest African minds, said, if you talk to a man in a language he understands, that goes to his head. But if you talk to him in his language, it goes to his heart. Think about it, profound statements. As you seek to develop this mind, start drinking from other great minds. Mandela says, if you talk to a man in a language he understands, it goes to his head. But if you talk to him in his language, it goes to his heart. This weekend, I'll be speaking in your language. Because I don't want it just to go to your head. I want it to go to your heart. And what this means is, I will be saying some things that will make you mad. But hopefully, it will challenge you and wake you up to dare go and do something about the condition on our continent, the condition within the Africans in diaspora, but above all, the condition in the church. Many African meetings, we just gather around and make a lot of noise, just a lot of hot air. I have been part of many African organizations, and quite frankly, it's a waste of time. We, we pontificate, we come out, we analyze all kinds of things. At the close of the day, nothing really gets down. It's a lot of noise. In fact, it is said that human minds are like wagons. When they have a light load to carry, they make much noise. And that is what seems to be uh, the case with many of our African meetings. I really hope that after this weekend, you are going to leave this place not to make noise, not to make some hot air, but that you are going to do something about our situation. I've given you a very long introduction to set the tone. Um, the message I'll be sharing with you this evening is very, very simple. It is straightforward. What's the title of my message? What's wrong with our mind? I will set forth a problem. Perhaps using the slides. And at the close, it will set a context by which you should listen to the various presenters that you'll be listening to this weekend. With this as long introduction, I would invite you to bow your heads for a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we are thankful for bringing us here this evening 
Thank you for travel mercies. Thank you for an opportunity that we can be here, speak in our own language, that is to say, speak candidly to each other, and that from this meeting, you will raise up a generation of men and women who will dare go forth and make a difference. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. This mind is a theme you have chosen, and it comes from Philippians chapter 2, from verse 5, which says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. This mind. If you take your Bible concordance, or if you have one of these computer search Bibles, and you type in the word mind, you'll be fascinated by how many descriptions there are. Humility of mind, reprobate mind, canal mind, spiritual mind, willing mind, fervent mind, ready mind, renewed mind, lowliness of mind, sameness of mind, fleshly mind, humbleness of mind, sound mind, one mind, mind of the Lord, mind of Christ, and then this mind. You didn't settle on any of these other minds. You chose this mind. Why? I can almost guarantee you don't know why. But it sounds good. This mind. But we are going to prove this, uh, hopefully, in the course of the week, in, at least in my presentations. This mind. It comes from Philippians 2, verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. There is one word which is called nous, N-O-U-S, nous. It is the word from which we get our English word noetic. It denotes a seat of reflection or consciousness, the faculty of perception, that which you used to know, to understand, to choose, to determine, to make judgment, that is news. But when Paul says in Philippians 2, uh, verse 5, let this mind be in you, he didn't use news. He used a different word, which is a cognate of the word phronema. P-H-R-O-N-E-M-A, phronema. It's a different word. And unlike the other word news, by the way, sometimes they mean about the same thing, but the slight difference is phronema denotes what one has in his mind. It has to do with his thought. The product of a thinking process. Another way of saying it is the word Paul used in Philippians 2 when he says this mind has to do with thinking, to be of a certain mindset or to be mindful of something. It is fascinating to know that this word, you know, phronema and its cognates, whether the verbal form, which is phroneo, is used at least seven or eight times in Philippians chapter 2. In fact, in the entire book of Philippians, it keeps coming up. Just to give you an idea, Philippians 1 verse 7. We are to think this. The word think is from the word phroneo. The Revised Standard Version is to be thus minded. Philippians 1 7. Philippians chapter 2, the chapter we are going to study perhaps tomorrow. Philippians chapter 2, it uses the word a mind, phroneo, uh, at least several times. Look at verse 2. Fulfill ye my joy that you may be like-minded. That's the word. Having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. That's the second time it has used the word in Philippians chapter 2. Then look at verse 3. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind. Let each esteem others better than themselves. And then you come to verse 5. Let this mind. Then when you go to chapter 3, verse 15, have this mind. Chapter 3, verse 19, set your mind on something. And chapter 4, verse 2, be of the same mind. 
Paul seems to deliberately choose this particular word for mind. Basically, Paul is saying, I want you to think this way. I want you to have a certain mindset. And specifically, I want you to think like Jesus. Have the mindset of Christ. Have the mind of Christ. In your brochure, there's a folder that has been given you. I have assembled for you a three-page compilation from the writings of Ellen White about the use of the word, the phrase, this mind. And when you go home, just read over it. You are going to discover, without this mind, the mind of Christ, you cannot be true Christians. You cannot be his disciples. You cannot enter the kingdom of God. You cannot be successful in anything. You cannot even be true missionaries or even ministers. On the other hand, if you have the mind of Christ, the result of having this mind is it will make you a better person in all your relations. It will affect the way you work. It will determine how you deal with trials and afflictions. It will make you truly kind and courteous. It will make you effective soul winners. It would enable you to obey the Lord regardless of circumstances. It would impact the way you conduct yourself when there are differences of opinion. It would determine how you use your finances. It would determine how you treat an erring one. It would determine even your attitude towards the Bible. Amazing. Anyway, this weekend, I'll be speaking on this mind, but... Um, Tonight, the question I'm simply going to ask you, and I'll be using the slides, is what is wrong with our mind? Why do we need this mind? And then tomorrow morning during the divine service, my message will be entitled, What kind of mind is this? You say, this mind. What kind of mind is this? And then there'll be a breakout session, I think on Sunday, we are going to talk about challenges to this mind. And finally, in the consecration service, the message will be entitled, A Transformed Mind. A Transformed Mind. But this hour, what's wrong with our mind? What I want to do is to give you an overview about our uh, situation on the continent of Africa. If time had allowed, I would have asked you some basic questions, because many of you are Africans, or Africans of the diaspora, but you know very little about the Africa for which you say Africans living in view of eternity. I don't want to embarrass you, but if I, I meant to, I would have asked you, what is the size of Africa? I know you don't know. What's the current population of Africa? You don't know. And yet, you are making plans for Africa, you don't even know the population. I would ask you, how many Christians are on the continent of Africa? I would also ask you, how many languages are spoken on the continent? I would ask you, what is the per capita income of the Africans? How much do they make? What kinds of sicknesses and diseases are killing us? I'll ask you a number of questions. And you have to know these facts, because unless you know this, how can you plan effectively and think? But because this weekend we are talking about mind, at least that's where most of my messages will be based on. Perhaps I should also ask you, who are the shepherds of African mind? Do you know the greatest African minds and thinkers? Your organizers have put in your brochure this little folder. It's a three-page folder, which basically is a survey that was conducted by the New African Magazine in, and published in August and September 2004. They made a survey. And basically, the survey 
asked, who are the hundred greatest Africans? If I were to ask you, can you name any of them? The hundred greatest Africans. Well, by flipping through, you'll see some of them. Um, it is interesting, uh, by the way, this is just a survey. It doesn't mean they are necessarily right, but at least it gives you an idea what people are thinking. Amongst the people, you are going to discover some of them are well-known, but some are not well-known. Among the well-known, who, who, who did the poll indicate is the number one greatest African leader or thinker? Nelson Mandela. Everyone pretty much knows him. In fact, his face is almost uh, an icon. You, you can basically pick him out in a crowd. Nelson Mandela. Who is number two? Kwame Nkrumah. He's a, uh, the torchbearer, the visionary for Africa. He was the man. And by the way, he was a student here in this country, University of Lincoln, Nebraska, somewhere. You know, he studied here. He said, no, we must go back home and bring liberation to Africa. And he started this whole wave. 1957, Ghana became the first country in sub-Saharan Africa to be independent. He is listed number two over there. There are, if you go through the names of the hundreds, some of them um, you may take for granted. For example, among the people are the African mother and the African child. They are considered the greatest because they are resilient in the face of adversity. So when you go home, take a closer look at our mothers and our children. There are other people, religious leader like Desmond Tutu. He is considered one of the great African minds or thinkers. And then I found something very fascinating, but I think it was a good one. The pygmies. Why? Because they have a knowledge of nature and the environment. And the world is now talking about environmental concerns, ecological concerns. The pygmies have something to offer us. And so they are amongst the greatest thinkers. And then in the list is Ali Mazrui. He is the one who pulled together that PBS documentary called The Africans. By the way, how many of you have watched it? You better check it out. He presents a thesis of Africa being a confluence of three major forces, Europeans, Africans, and then Muslims. Fascinating documentary. You better watch it. It's, it's, it's available. The Africans is the title. And then there were, uh, uh, there were, at least I saw some musicians there also. By the way, that hundred uh, list is not just Africans on the continent, but also Africans in diaspora. Among them were Miriam Makiba. You know her? Have you heard the name? She's considered the Mama Africa and the Empress of African Song from South Africa. And then, of course, we have Kofi Annan also. When you scan through the names and you think and reflect on it, you are going to discover something. The vast majority of the people who were chosen were all political leaders from post-independent era. Majority of them were political leaders. And so the editors of the New African Magazine asked a question. They said, and I'm quoting, the results are disappointing. It shows that African governments and educationists have to review the kind of history and education we are teaching and providing in our schools. Without knowing our path and where we came from, we can hardly know our present and why we are here and plan for the future. Why is it that they are all political leaders, a majority of them? Where are the scientists? Where are the teachers? Another observation from this survey is that few Christian leaders are mentioned. Few missionaries, if any, and not even martyrs. There's a South African magazine. It's more towards the apartheid uh, mindset, Christian Action magazine. They raise a question, and the question is, why are some of the greatest names of church history not included in this list? Names like Tertullian, 
Oregon, Clement, Augustine. What about Bible characters like Simon of Cyrene? He was an African. What about the a treasure of Queen Candace of Ethiopia, the Ethiopian Enoch in Acts 8? What about the gentleman who carried the cross of Christ? How come their names are not mentioned? And by the way, even no Seventh-day Adventist is mentioned over there. It's interesting. And then I also discovered that few contemporary thinkers and positive role models are mentioned. You'll find in the list well-known footballers like Pelé and the rest, sportsmen and sportswomen. you see rock musicians like Bob Marley and others. But why is it that today's scientific minds and those making major contributions in global proportions are rarely recognized? Is it because they are non-existent? What about women and young people? Very few are listed over there. And as I said, no Seventh-day Adventists. That should trouble you. We have some great African minds, but they are not well known. Let me see whether you, you, you know this. Do you know the Africa or the person He's an African, by the way. He theorized that 65,000 computers around the world could work together to forecast the weather. This theoretical supercomputer with 65,000 nodes is known as the internet. This man sat down. He said, okay, you have your computer, I have my computer, let's get 65,000 computers, find a way to link all of them together and solve the world's problem. And to do so, this person solved the most difficult problem in supercomputing by reformulating Newton's second law of motion, and he made it 18 equations and algorithms, and then he rewrote Newton's equation as 24 million algebraic equations, and finally he programmed the 65 computer processes to work as one to solve 24 million equations at the speed of 3.1 billion calculations in one second. An African. Do you know about him? His name? Philip Emeagwali from Nigeria. He is considered a father of the internet. Bill Clinton calls him one of the great minds of the information. He has won so many awards. Oh, by the way, his name is listed in the 100 thinkers, number 35. Do you know this also? I'm just asking you. This person is a spiritual leader and passionate advocate for women's rights, democracy, and the environment. She was in prison and beaten repeatedly for her courageous stance on these issues. And then in 2004, she received a Nobel Peace Prize. He called upon the world to plant one billion trees in 2007 to fight global warming. Do you know this person? What's her name? Wangari Mathai from Kenya. You've got to know her. Nobel Peace Prize winner and the founder of the Green Belt Movement. Brilliant woman. What about this? Do you know of this gentleman? He holds PhD and many other degrees in aerodynamics and aeronautics from MIT. He is a world-class and world-leading inventor. He has many patents for entire cruise missile and aircraft uh, development so that they can travel at the speed four to eight times the speed of sound. He is a senior technologist at NASA's John Glenn Research Center. There are about 1,250 scientists working for NASA, engineers. This man is one of the 12 elite scientists recognized as senior technologists. So if you are looking for the best engineers and scientists at NASA, the 12 is one of them. In 2006, last year, the president awarded him, the president of USA awarded him presidential rank award for meritorious senior executive. I mean, he is so brilliant that the whole world, even the, the Russians, the space program, they have to consult him. And as a result of the cons consultation, he has even mastered the Russian language. 
He was awarded 2005 Emerald Honest Scientist of the Year by Science Spectrum. Do you know him? You don't. His name is Dr. Isaac Blanson from Ghana. And right now, he is working to help African universities. I know the university I attended. He is establishing a department of aeronautics on that campus. We must start thinking, you know, like NASA scientists. Why is it that we only go and plant, you know, tomatoes and whatever? That's what our engineers do. Great minds. What about this person? This person says, I see myself as a Mandela. I'll take one term. I'll take hard decisions. I'll get the country on track, get the economy functioning, get our people in school. So I'll serve for one term. I'll do the job, do the unpopular things, the right thing, and after that, I'll resign. She is the head of Africa's oldest republic, which was founded by freed slaves in 1847. She was twice imprisoned in the 1980s by the military leaders. She fled into exile. Her nickname is the Iron Lady of Africa, and she's the first elected female head of state. Do you know her? What's her name? Ellen Selif Johnson of Liberia. Do you know this person? He has received distinguished service awards from many African leaders. He is the second ranking officer of the world's fastest Protestant denomination in the world. Do you know him? You don't. His name, Matthew Bediako, Executive Secretary of the General Conference. Some of you even have no clue. The Seventh-day Adventist Church is the most important religious movement in the world, if you take Bible prophecy seriously. And this number two person, the next in line, as it were, is an African. What do they all have in common? What you are going to discover, and I could give you many other names, they all at one time were here in the United States. They studied here. And then they started making a difference. And the world is listening. You see, what do these African trivia got to do with our life and our theme? I'm, I'm setting the tone. I, know, I don't know, how much time do I have? Let me take a few more minutes, okay? Because I want to give you an orientation because we choose themes and we want to address issues, but in order to address issues, you need to take a painful look. We need to look at the past 50 years of Africa's history. We cannot do any differently unless we know what the problem is, where we have been, where we are today, and where we ought to go. I, 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 perhaps I should use this to, to... As you know, Ghana was the first African country to be independent. And this year marked the 50th anniversary because Ghana's independence literally changed the face of Africa, the celebration, they call it a golden jubilee. Many African leaders, scholars, African-American, they all converged to Ghana. Because Ghana's history is sometimes also the history of every African nation. We've gone through our ups and downs, military coups, mismanagement, nepotism, and all of this. And so they were all there. I was there, because every uh, spring, February, March, I go to Ghana to conduct evangelism on one of the universities, and this was a very unique event. I've never seen anything like this. What I'm going to do is I'll give you a brief history or a brief update on what took place over there and bring our minds to an issue. Ghana and Nkrumah became independent from colonial rule in 1957, and our current president is John Kufuo. Both were trained. Nkrumah, part of his education here in this country and in England, brilliant scholar. John Kufuo trained at Oxford, brilliant scholar and barrister. And so their uh, reign, as it were, their governments marked two ending points of a major historical event in Africa. And in Ghana, it was celebrated with a lot of 
fanfare. They carved, they made special coins with, with the 50, Ghana at 50. They, they artistically uh, did it. And if you know Ghana, there is, within the 50, the zero, there is a design. We call it Jinyami, which means it is only by the grace of God. And uh, the theme chosen was championing African excellence. Championing African excellence. The question uh, I, I, I raise is, why is it that it has taken us 50 years to finally think that we need to emphasize uh, uh, what do you call it? championing excellence? And they, they have an impressive program lined out for the year. Every single month, something is going on. In January, Ghanaians are called to reflect, and for, for that matter, Africans. In February, towards emancipation. Uh, March, freedom march. In April, one nation, one people. The message throughout the nation and abroad is we must be united as one nation. No tribalism, no war. In May, our wealth and our prosperity, we must rethink how we are using our resources. In June, Heroes of Ghana Month, we are going to highlight the great Ghanaians who are making a contribution so that you don't always look up to someone else as a hero. In July, they will be talking about African unity because Ghana's independence was intricately connected with you know, the total emancipation of Africa and Ghana has played a leading role in the African Union or African unity. Then in August, we are going to focus on the diaspora where we are going to talk about black people scattered all over the globe, in America, in Europe, in South Pacific, in South America, everywhere. That will be the month. In September, service to the nation. In October, knowledge and Ghana's development. The emphasis will be education, knowledge. In November, healthy people, a healthy nation, is going to be on health. Can you imagine if Adventists were there with our health message? And then the final curtain in December. Impressive program. In any case, there was a big celebration in Ghana, especially during the independence. Our independence was 6 March 57. So it was a time of celebration. It started the night of 5th March. It kicked off with a lot of fireworks at what we call the Independence Square, where you can see this. I wish the light were a little better, but hopefully you can use your mind, imagination, to see it, you know. Um, it started with, uh, from the Kwame Nkrumah uh, Mausoleum, right there at the airport, because it was there that on March 6, 1957, Nkrumah announced to the world, today, from now on, there is a new African in the world. Ghana, our beloved country, is free forever. And then he also proclaimed, our independence is meaningless unless it is linked up with the total liberation of the African continent. And that is why Ghana has the black star as its symbol. This black star, the star is saying a, a star can be black. Stars are not only white. A star can be black. And a black star can shine. That's why our football team is called the Ghana Black Star. So at our independence square, we have this uh, thing. If many people were telling in Kroma, why do you want independence for Ghana and for Africa? It is dangerous. You don't know how to handle things. And Nkrumah responded, we prefer self-government with danger to servitude in tranquility. I would rather face danger being free than being at peace, being a slave. Nkrumah was a thinker. He was way ahead of his time. Some said, okay, we'll grant you independence, but the best way to be independent is you must first learn how to be independent before you'll be free. And Nkrumah responded, the best way of learning to be an independent sovereign state is to be an independent sovereign state. And then they said, okay, when you get independence, the Soviet Union, there's the Western world, will you go east or west? Where would you go? And Kroma responded, we face neither east nor west, we face forward. He was such a radical. And this ignited the whole way. Go and study your history. You are going to discover Ghana's independence was linked with black American independence. And so, during the celebration, it, I've never seen a nation, I thought only Americans were patriotic, but when I went to Ghana, I discovered Patriotism, young and old, everyone was wrapped under Ghana's flag. Even little kids, the girls and the ladies, they painted their braids 
in the Ghana's colors. I don't see whether you can see them. Some painted their bodies. I mean, everyone was excited. In fact, some of them were so hilarious. They painted their whole bodies with the colors of Ghana's flag, red, green, and yellow. You know, red, the people who died for independence, green, our natural, you know, vegetation and the rest, and then the yellow, our natural resources, gold, diamond, and the rest, and of course the black star. People painted themselves. It, there seemed to be something that has happened. Some of the paintings on their bodies were very weird. It looked so strange. Some of them were simply outrageous, you know. And then, of course, somewhere sovereign also. Ghana has a distrust for military, but for the first time, people saluted the military because we have peace. Many folks came from all over the world to, to, to visit this nation. There were at least 20 heads of states from all over. The Nigerian president was there, uh, Tambo Mbeki from South Africa, Selim John. I mean, they were there. Even contingents from Europe, they were there. Uh, civil rights leaders from this country, Jesse Jackson, and many others were all there on this occasion. And when these heads of state arrived at the airport, there was this special parade lined up for them and their citizens, because Ghana has been peaceful for uh, quite a long time. Ghana has many immigrants in the country. So when their heads of state arrived, they lined up the streets of Accra to welcome them. You know, um, the Nigerian president, Selif Johnson, from Liberia, Ghana has a large population of Liberians, you know. Even the people like Jesse Jackson, and they were all there. People like, oh, W.E.B. Du Bois. You know, he landed in Ghana. That's where he lived. That's where he died with his wife. And, you know, Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, they were all linked with something. They were there. And, of course, you know, Kofi Annan and his wife, um, where all the, the Independence Square celebrations was exciting. I mean, everywhere, people knew something has happened, something important. They were celebrating, they were rejoicing over the event. England sent Scottish musicians, and then they wrote, wrote their skirts, and they were doing their thing. They were all there on that occasion. They were uh, the traditional rulers. They were all there, young people. And, of course, during the independence uh, parade, we had our crack soldiers. You know, you see our soldiers, you know, Ghanaian soldiers. I mean, come on. We can't compare with U.S. But when you saw the way they marched, you know, and with their clean clothes, you know, apparently many of them got some money from peacekeeping. So they dress up. And you, you really think, you know, they can even fight America. <laughs> you know, uh, they, they, you know, you see the military, it was night, and the police also were there, still clad in their black or blue. I mean, it's hot over there, and they are still in black. Someone has to change their mindset. Anyway, um, but it was a happy occasion that a nation, after all the turmoils, are in peace. The Navy was there. The Air Force. Even our girls, you know, who are in the Air Force, you see them, and quite frankly, when I see some of you girls from Ghana and Prior Africa here, and you are... Come on, go back home. You see that some people are doing something, you know. And of course, the president of Ghana, you know, went around, you know, inspecting, you know, the, the parade, the little girls and boys, they were doing their thing. I think they studied this from the Chinese, you know. They did their colors and waved it. It was so nice. You, it, it's the traditional rulers in their golden attire and regalia. Uh, it, it was, uh, if, if the lights were really dim, you would have seen the beauty in the Akente clothes. Everyone was, uh, it was a time for dancing. I'm coming to why we need to change our minds. It was a time for dancing, traditional dancing. Everyone was happy. Then we had the church dancing too. It was also there. And then, of course, the young people who don't know the Lord, they also do their own dancing. All people's dancing. And then the teenagers who don't have anything to do, they also do their dancing. Everyone was into it, all in the Ghanaian colors. And then, of course, we have the traditional drama. Even the president has to step down and respond to the dance. It was a time of vigorous debate. Our former president, Jerry Rollins, said he wasn't going to attend the celebration. Why? Because the president and his wife are fighting. So he says, I will not come. And then the nation said, who are you not to come? We are not respecting you because you are good looking. We are respecting your office. So if you will not come, go your way. And he said, okay, I'm going my way. So he left for South Africa. I mean, and people blasted him. Ghana has a vigorous press. So many independent radio and television stations. So very, the reason Ghana has peace is because of the freedom of the press. So people speak their minds. They don't resort to guns and bows and arrows. And even 
there was debate about our currency. You know, Ghana uses what we call the CD. We spent about $20 million on this independent celebration. So people said, why should we waste this much money? It can go to do this. I happen to have a contrary opinion. Even the president also had his share. People blasted him. He said, why is it that you, the president of Ghana, on our independence day, you wear a suit? Why can't you wear traditional African clothes? You are still, you know, a slave to the Europeans. I mean, everyone was blasted. But it was a time. A time when there was unity. Opposition leaders, they were all came together. They lit the independence flame, championing excellence. Even Ghanaians abroad were all caught in it. In Washington, they see there was celebration. In Belgium, there was celebration. In United Kingdom, in Italy, in Chicago, in Winnipeg, Canada, where we had Ghanaian drama troupe, they all did their thing. Churches, Atlanta, Georgia, Norway, Beirut, which was on, in flames because of the war. Ghana has a large population group in Beirut, and in, in its independence, there were many uh, Lebanese in Ghana as well. In Arusha, Tanzania, they celebrated with playing soccer because Ghana loves soccer. I mean, it was a nice thing. Even Adventists in this country had a major service at the Washington, D.C., uh, no, the Silver Spring, our church headquarters. Question. What do all this have to do with our Alive retreat? After all the fanfare and the fireworks and all these celebrations, Ghana's independence is a time to ask some serious questions, not just by Ghanaians, but by every African. Why did it take us 50 long years to start thinking about excellence? What is wrong with our continent? What is wrong with our mind? Ghana at 50 is asking a question that the shape of Africa has been asking. At the close of the day, after all the fanfare and fireworks and dancing and whatever, people are going to go back home hungry. Little children are going back home on empty stomachs. Africa is experiencing poverty in the midst of abundant resources. See, today is a very long presentation because I'm setting a problem. Africa has resources. Someone has mapped out Africa and discovered it is made up of economic islands. From Nigeria and Niger, we have what we call black gold, petroleum. You go to Ghana, it has gold. Then you go to, you know, uh, Central Africa, you know, copper, Zambia, I mean, uh, manganese. 95% of the world's diamonds are on the continent of Africa, between Namibia and Sierra Leone, that's why they were fighting. Gold. Almost 80 to 90% of the world's gold are on the continent of Africa, and yet we are poor. I know Ghana's gold alone, the U.S. satellite maps indicate that the surface gold, they call it alluvial gold, on a rainy day you can actually pick gold nuggets. The alluvial gold deposit in Ghana, if every Ghanaian is giving one billion dollars every year, we will have enough gold to last us 110 years. And yes, we are poor. Why? And you can ask the same, cobalt, chromate, 99% of the world's chromate is on the continent of, we have abundant resources, and yet we are poor. We are starving, despite the fact that we have enough land. We can grow pretty much everything on the continent of Africa year round. And yet, our people are dying every single day. You may have seen this film that was uh, a picture taken by Kevin Carter. A little child in Sudan, walking towards a food center because of the farming. He was so weak, he had lost a parent. And he was so weak that he literally collapsed. And a vulture was stopping, uh, sitting, waiting for the child to die for him to face, the, the vulture to face. This picture by Kevin uh, Carter won him the Pulitzer Prize. It was splashed all over the world. It had such a haunting impact on, on people and him that three months after he took that picture, he committed suicide. 
He said, I cannot wait to see people die and the world is doing nothing about it. I'm talking about the African problem. Our population is increasing. The farmland use is decreasing. When I was in Ghana during the independence, I gave lectures over there in some of the universities. And I said, will our land continue to produce? We have tilled the land for so long, we do not even think how to replenish the resources. And so go to your villages. The lands your mothers and grandmothers used to cultivate, now they cannot bear anything anymore. And so we have to start thinking what we can do. Those of you studying here, is there something you can do short of just chemical fertilizers? Ghana has a lot of festivals. In the region where I went this past time at the university, they have a deer festival. Every year they will go around in groups and catch live deers and do some celebration. And so I asked them, with rapid ecological changes, without any sustainable preservation, will there be deers left? for their festivals. Every year they go and catch the deers, but they are not growing deers. And that's the African mindset. Our seas and rivers, will they continue producing enough fish? And will the fish be safe? We have a problem. AIDS. We don't want to talk about it because we all look cute and impressive. It's a forbidden subject. It's a disease we fear to talk about, and yet it's life. It is killing millions of us. The world's leading killer of AIDS. Oh, sorry, Africa has the most, you know, uh, people dying from AIDS. And what are we doing about it? It is with us. It won't go away. What is the hope for the AIDS orphans? Hundreds, thousands of them are left. They have lost their parents. Who will take care of them? I'm speaking to you because you are the answer to the problem. Malaria. 600 million new malaria infections every year. In my country, Ghana alone, one child dies every 30 seconds. 20,000 children die every year from malaria. And one reason, the pharmacist when they are supposed to administer the medication, if they know it takes, let's say, 40, you know, whatever concentration of 40, to make more money, they dilute it. So that they can make more money. So people take the medication, it has no effect. And so the malaria, the, the mosquitoes, are building resistance to it. And so we are dying like flies. Who would do something about it? Bed flu? It's alive and well in Africa. When I was in Ghana, it was announced in the news because Ghana is about two or three countries away from Nigeria. We had bird flu in Nigeria. And then I said, Ghanaians, don't think it is in Nigeria because birds don't need visas to fly to Ghana. And by the time I left Ghana, the bird flu has arrived there. Are we thinking about some of these problems? The cost of war. Liberia, Sierra Leone, Sudan, Rwanda, everywhere. I mean, some of them are so barbaric and they are fighting over nothing. I recall in Liberia and Sierra Leone, during the war, they will even arrest people and then they will ask you, do you want short sleeve or long sleeve? When you say short sleeve, they will chop off your upper arm. Sleep. If you say you want long sleeve, they will chop off your hand. Africans' mindset. What has this got to do with life? Look at these kids. What wrong have they caused to suffer this? I am posing to you a problem. What's wrong with our mind? You can have all the fireworks and the celebration and do all the dancing and parades, but at the close of the day, we have a problem. And talking about child soldiers, little kids as old as two and a half, three years, are arrested and brainwashed and drugged and given weapons to kill. 
Now, if this is going on, and it is, hundreds of thousands of them, then what future does it hold for Africa? Because from childhood, this man's mind, this child's mind, has been trained to kill. And you have the answer. I want you to know the problem we face as Africans. So you don't just meet, run, eat the rice, and then go home, and then do nothing about it. The price of tribal racism. You can decry all the racism in America, but we have our own racism. We call it tribalism. In Rwanda alone, about a million people died in three months. The largest number of people killed in the history of the world in a short period of time. 100,000 of them were Seventh-day Adventists. Some Adventists killed their fellow Adventists. Even a church leader tried by the you know, war crime tribunal. And as the report goes, during the height of the genocide, a minister would announce, let's stop the killing. It's Friday. It's a Sabbath has begun. Let's continue after Sabbath. What's wrong with our mind? And we cannot talk about it even in the church because we are afraid we will offend somebody. And the grief still remains. In our audience are some of your fellows who lost their loved ones. Tribalism. Racism. Their only crime is they belong to one tribe. And unless we change our mindset, which sometimes even filters into the church, we cannot even make decisions, choose leaders, unless they come from our tribe. This is the problem we are facing. So when you talk about the mind, we better start thinking. It was Nelson Mandela who said, I detest racialism because I regard it as barbaric thing, whether it comes from black man or white man. Sometimes we think it's only white people who have racism, but I've lived long enough to discover black racism can even be worse. It is true in this country. It is true in Africa. And that's one of the tragedies of our black and white conferences in this country, which we can't talk about. If you talk about it, you are a troublemaker. Racism has killed thousands and millions, is stifling African development, and you need a different mindset. And this, as we speak, there's an ongoing genocide taking place in the Darfur region of Sudan. Who will stop it? Who will stop it? Kofi Annan is quoted as saying, many African leaders refuse to send their troops on peacekeeping missions abroad because they probably need their armies to intimidate their own populations. So we go to meetings, we make a lot of hot air, and we do nothing about it. Can give you more problems. Environmental pollution. We burn our lands, our forests. We throw garbage everywhere. We throw petrochemicals into our water systems. Raw sewage is dumped into drinking water. I mean, I, I want you to know the problem. See, when you come to America, you sit in meetings, wonderful facilities, well-dressed up, trim, and you don't realize the problems we face. And yet, we need people with a certain kind of mind to do something about infant mortality. There's death and dying all over us. And so, 50 years after independence, we must ask some serious questions, and these are some of the questions you must ask yourself at an alive retreat of Africans so you can find out what we can do about it. What is wrong with us? What's wrong with us as Africans? Have we been doomed? Nigerian professor 
Professor Adebayo identified Africa's problems with seven Ds, the letter D, desertification. The desert is spreading. We are not planting trees. Every year, miles, drought, demography, that's racism. Disequilibrium, political instability, debt, disease, and dependency. We are so dependent on people. So we live in America, we export to Africa. What do we export? Used cars, used clothes, used underwears, and even used ideas. We become consumers, we can't think. So you sit in your classes and just swallow everything the professor says without thinking through it and analyzing and challenging it. Dependency. We want someone to spoon feed us. So you start alive, you want to do a program, then you go around soliciting for funds, let someone come and help. What can you do for yourself? I analyze the problem with seven P's, using PIP and P's. Needless poverty, misplaced priorities. We put a lot of money into buying guns. Abuse of power, whether in the church or outside the church. When someone gets position, they become a chief, president for life. And it's the same in the church. So we are not cultivating leaders. And when people rise up to train a generation of people to think and be leaders, they become troublemakers. Abuse of power, bad politics, lifestyle of polygamy, a culture of pornography. When you are trying to promote African culture here in America, how do you promote African culture? You get some scantily dressed girls to dance, checking you know, their body parts, and we call it African culture. And then I have what I call the African PhD syndrome. PhD stands for pull him down. Whenever someone is rising, then our mindset is, let's pull him down. So we backbite, we attack, we fight them, we do all kinds of things. This is the mindset. And the question is, what can we do about our problem? And what ought we to be doing? There's a Chinese proverb which says, if you want one year of prosperity, grow grain. If you want 10 years of prosperity, grow trees. If you want 100 years of prosperity, grow people. Grow people. Train people. But it isn't all kinds of people we should grow. We must grow. Only a certain kind. People who use their minds. The Nigerian scholar, the scientist, who is a father of the internet, said, unless Africa significantly increases its intellectual capital, the continent will remain irrelevant in the 21st century and even beyond. Africa needs innovators, producers of knowledge and wise men and women who can discover, propose, and then implement progressive ideas. We need thinkers. Do you understand what I'm saying, talking about? Kwame Nkrumah, we hated him when he was alive. We killed him, thanks to CIA and African corrupt leaders. We killed him. But this is what he said. He said, revolutions are brought about by men, by men who think as men of action and act as men of thought. They think as men of action, Whatever they think and they discuss, they know they are going to implement. And yet, they act as men of thought. Some of us just think, 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 talk, debate, do, and do nothing. And some of us do, 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 we don't think about it. We need thinkers. What's the problem with our mind? I would dare say the problem is not because we lack educated people. They think, you know, we don't have much educated minds. As if education alone is enough. We already have enough educated people. We have so many PhDs. If education is all our problem, then we have it. Or we don't have resources. We have all the resources we need. We have them all. 
And I call your attention to some contemporary thinkers, world-class thinkers. I recall when you go to Texas alone, we have a number of Nigerian doctors and scientists who can even solve Africa's problem. But they are all there, chiefs, wearing their big clothes, making a lot of noise. You go to Birmingham, England, a lot of Zimbabweans, educated, brilliant people. What are we doing? South Africa? I'm going there in August. I've been invited to come and speak a couple of times. Sometimes the ASI say, I'm not going unless you are willing to do something. And so I gave them an assignment. Unless you are willing to do something, don't even waste my time. And one test is, this year we are going to do something and I want you, you, you to be involved to start it. And they say we are going to do So we are going to do something. South Africa alone. And after apartheid, a lot of people. Educated, brilliant. I know, even Andrews University, where we are trained, go there, you see a lot of Africans. I recall when I was studying there at one point, there was a time when more than half of all the doctoral students in the seminary were Africans. Don't tell me our problem is we need educated minds. No. What our problem is, is a mindset. You didn't get it. It is not just more minds. We need people with a different kind of mindset. Because what we have ended up doing is we have trained people and they have become educated, selfish people. There's a lot of ignorance, superstition. And when you add education to it, it becomes something else. We have colonial mentality. Uh, I wish there's time, I'll, I'll go through, perhaps there will be time some other. Africa's problem, what's wrong with us, is a spiritual problem. And it has to do with our minds. And the Bible describes it as the universal condition of the human mind. And it is fallen and it needs to be transformed or renewed. You find this in Romans 12, 12. Be ye transformed by the renewal of the mind. Ephesians 4, 23. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. The mindset must change. The African problem is actually a human problem. Romans 1, 28. Since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind. When you give up on God, that's what happens. So if you are studying, you are working, and you take God out, that case, First Peter 1, 13 to 14, prepare your minds for action. Do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. The ignorance is a lack of knowledge of God. Ephesians 4, 17 to 18. You must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. So our problem is not merely educated minds, but also transformed minds. One of Ghana's leading scholars He's called the Educator of Africa, the Booker T. Washington of Africa. Brilliant man, you've got to know about him. Go study about him. Write thesis about him, Dr. Agri. Studied here some time. AMS Zion leader. When men are intellectually greater than others, we learn from their utterances. When they are morally better than others, we learn from their lives. Education is important. But what we need is also spiritual excellence. Africa needs new minds. We need the mind of Christ. We need people who aspire to professional excellence as well as spiritual excellence. That is what we need. And the Bible tells us, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. If 
We need to have the mind of Christ. If Christ's mind must be in us, it means we must first be out of our minds, our old minds, before we can have the mind of Christ. Did you get it? We must first be out of our mind. Only then can you get the mind of Christ. And when you have the mind of Christ, people will think you are out of your mind. You are crazy. Something is wrong with you. But because the people who say this have a different mindset and they are judging you by it. So when they see a student who is spending their time, their resources for God's work, they say, are you crazy? Are you out of your mind? Say yes. I'm out of a different mindset because I have a new mind. Why do you get intimidated when people say all kinds of things about you? You need some tough skin. Let people say whatever they will say. They are with a a futile, debased, depraved, whatever mindset. Do you understand? Let this mind be in you. It means we must be out of our mind. We must be out of our mind to make a difference. We need the mind of Christ. This mind is the highest form of education anyone can have. It is the measure of a great person. It is not your stature. It is not your weight. But it is the quality of your mind that makes a difference. So this weekend, we have gathered here to seek this mind. To seek this mind. If you are just going to come here and go through the motions and eat and waste all of our time, then quite frankly, it is not worth the effort. But perhaps there will be one person here, perhaps two, who would live here and make up their mind, I am going to be a different kind of person, a different kind of student, a different kind of professional. Because our whole mindset is eat, drink, get married, find babies. Is that it? We need to change our mind. What's wrong with our mind? It's because we don't have the mind of Christ, the mindset we need in your mind. The question is, this weekend, is it your desire, by the grace of God, to have this mind? Is that your wish? Is that your prayer? Are you going to think about these things and seek to do something different? If that is your wish and prayer, why not stand as we pray? Heavenly Father, we've taken more than enough time to set forth a problem. We have a problem. This weekend, These young men and women of African descent and their friends have gathered here to seek to know your will on a number of issues, but more importantly, to seek the mind of Christ. Speak to us compellingly throughout the various presentations, in our interactions, in our activities. Lay burdens on our hearts that will keep us restless until we go and do something. Let your Holy Spirit transform our minds. May he convict us, lead us to repentance, and 
guide us step by step as we go forth to make a difference. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, Lord. 